Hi, I'm Eric Carson, one of the quaternary geologists at the WGNHS. I will be speaking about the status of current mapping and the proposal for upcoming mapping funded by State Map. If you have any questions regarding this presentation, please feel free to contact me at my email address shown on the screen. This image shows the status of 1 to 100,000 scale quaternary mapping in the state of Wisconsin. In this presentation, I will be focusing on the blue area, which will be a status update for the recently completed mapping project along the lower Wisconsin River, and the yellow area, which will be the proposal for the upcoming year's funding for surficial mapping projects. The multi-year project along the lower Wisconsin River has just wrapped up its eighth and final year. Previous year's mapping are shown on this image in pale blue, and the most recent year is shown in pale orange. Dots that are spread across the map show the location of geoprobe and rotosonic cores, with previous year's cores shown in blue, and the most recent years shown in magenta. As you can see, most of the cores collected during the most recent year are within the year's mapping area, but there are select cores that have been collected throughout Vernon, Crawford, Richland, and Iowa counties to fill in gaps in data as the project is wrapping up, and also to test hypotheses about mapping decisions that have been made. One of the last major issues to be resolved on this project is how to map upland surfaces. On this image, upland surfaces are shown in the bright white. Throughout the mapping area and throughout the driftless area as a whole, upland surfaces are covered by a few meters to as much as 10 meters of windblown silt, or LUS, deposited during the last glaciation. Because these upland surfaces are so extensive throughout much of the mapping area, particularly in southern Monroe County and across Vernon County, it would not be informative to simply map them as the surface material, the windblown silt. And so I have chosen to use the dense network of geoprobe cores that have been collected over the course of the mapping project, combined with the high resolution LIDAR data that we have available, in order to address not just the material that's at the surface, but the underlying material that the LUS is deposited on. It has long been known that beneath the LUS, much of the upland surfaces in the mapping area are capped by dolomites of the Prey de Chine group. It has also long been understood that dolomites throughout the driftless area tend to weather chemically to form a red residual clay known as the round tree formation. Using the dense network of data provided by the geoprobe cores that I have collected, I have been able to demonstrate, however, that the upland surfaces in the mapping area are not solely capped by the Prairie de Chine group. As a result of this, I have developed a series of mapping units to cover the upland surfaces that reflect not just the LUS at the surface, but which stratigraphic layer is underlying the LUS. The Paleozoic bedrock units that are found throughout the entirety of the driftless area are depicted by the stratigraphic column at right. They extend from the Cambrian Elk Mound group up through the Ordovician Maquoketa Shale. The bedrock layers that are found in the Lower Wisconsin Mapping Project are a somewhat more limited set, extending from the Cambrian Wanawak Sandstone up through the Ordovician Sinope Group Dolomite. These are depicted by the light green bar. My mapping has shown that the upland surfaces in the map area are capped by three different layers. These are depicted by the light blue bar and blue box. These three layers are the Prairie de Chine group dolomite, the Reedstown member of the St. Peter sandstone, and the Tonti member of the St. Peter sandstone. The differing lithologies and weathering characteristics of these three units lead to three different and distinct materials underlying the LUS where each is the cap rock. They also each have a distinct surface morphology that's apparent in the LIDAR, and thus I have derived 
three different map units to cover the upland surfaces in the map area that reflect each of these three bedrock units. It's important to note, looking at the right side of the stratigraphic column, that the contact between the Praetorian group Dolomite and the St. Peter formation is unconformable. There is significant topography imparted on the contact between the Praetorian group and the Reedstown member of the St. Peter sandstone. The next three slides depict core data and surface morphology associated with each of the three bedrock units as they cap the upland surfaces. On the left of each slide are three discrete portions of a single representative geoprobe core, each image showing 70 centimeters of the core. They are laid out so the uppermost portion of the core is on the left, the lowermost portion of the core is on the right. The LiDAR hillshade image on the right side of the slide will be shown at the same scale on all three of the next slides. This first slide shows areas where the Praetorian group Dolomite is the cap rock. The Praetorian group Dolomite often weathers to the round tree formation residual clay, a red clay with abundant chert class in it. In the core photos to the left, Chert class are identified by the green stars immediately beside the core photos. On the right side of the slide, the characteristic morphology associated with the Praetorian group is a sharp break in slope from the upland surface to the hillside with a distinct scalloped appearance to that edge of the slope. The map unit associated with this bedrock has been designated La Sun Residuum. This second slide shows information associated with places where the Reedstown member of the St. Peter Sandstone caps the upland surfaces. The geoprobe core data on the left show a distinct departure from the round tree formation shown in the previous slide. The Reedstown member weathers to clays that are black, brown, red, orange, yellow, and even white to pale green, as well as yellow and orange sands. The surface morphology associated with the Reedstown member is pointed out by the black arrows. Tributary streams that reach up onto the upland surface often blow out into distinct cauliflower-shaped depressions. If you remember that the contact between the Reedstown member and the underlying Praetorian group is unconformable, with significant topography imparted into it, you can expect that there are places adjacent to one another that have Reedstown member of the St. Peter Sandstone capping the upland surface in one place, right next to areas where the Prairie Sheen group capped the upland surface. And this is even shown in this photo. As the Reedstown member occupies the central portion of the LiDAR image, but in the extreme southeast and northwest portions of the LiDAR image, you start to pick up the morphology seen in the last slide that's associated with the Prairie de Chien group. This last image depicts information associated with places where the Tonti member of the St. Peter Sandstone is the cap rock on the upland. Unconsolidated sediment cover in these areas is typically quite thin, usually no more than five meters. And the core image on the right shows a gradation from LUS on the left immediately down into weathered orange and yellow sand. The very bottom of the core on the right even shows brown and green clays associated with the very top of the Reedstown member. The surface morphology is associated with the Tonti member being a scarp former, and you can see spurs of ridges extending away from the little town of Fargo, Wisconsin, each, each spur bounded by scarps of the Tonti member of the St. Peter Sandstone. There's also the presence of morphologies associated with the underlying Reedstown member, and the blue shaded arrow points out a relatively poorly but still poorly formed but still recognizable cauliflower-shaped depression at the head of a tributary. 
I'll loop back to this image of the distribution of geoprobe cores collected during the project to emphasize the point that the density of data I've collected has allowed me to make these strong correlations between material underlying the loss and surface morphology, which has allowed me to map these buried materials as surficial units. I'll now speak for a moment about the two projects that will be proposed during the fiscal year 2021 state map proposal. And these are extensions of the now completed Lower Wisconsin River Mapping Project. The first of the two will be to complete mapping in Monroe County. In the image of Monroe County on the right, you can see that it's divided between three different projects. The now completed fiscal year 2012 to 2019 Lower Wisconsin River Project. The currently underway fiscal year 2020 mapping project of northeastern port portion of Monroe County and the proposed northwest corner to complete the county at the 100,000 scale. The second quaternary project that will be proposed is to map Lafayette County in the southwestern corner of the state. The map on the right depicts the three most southwestern counties, Grant, Iowa, and Lafayette, shaded in yellow with the geoprobe cores that have already been collected with ongoing and previous state map projects in red and cores collected for a DNR grant studying the round tree formation in dark blue. Because of the mapping that has already been done in Iowa County and Grant County, the previous and ongoing core collection, which may well continue into Lafayette County, we have the flexibility to potentially complete this mapping project of the entire county in either one or two years. With that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you virtually on the 18th.